This is Film Focus with Emily Cook. I'm here in a dark grading theatre in Soho in London at the prestigious post-production house Company 3, where I'm excited to be joined by one of the world's top film colourists, Paul Ensby, who's freshly back from LA, where he's been grading new release, the Allegiant feature film. Hello, Paul. Hello, Emily. How are you? I'm very well. I'm uh, very bronzed. Very bronzed. I'm very pleased to be back in London, of course. Excellent. Well, it's good to have you here. In a nutshell, can you explain what a colourist does and how the grading process works? Well, putting it simply as I can, every TV show or feature film or goes through a process before it's finally released where it has some form of colour correction. In my case, which is mainly feature films, it takes about some two to three weeks, possibly sometimes more, where you're sitting with the director, the director of photography, the editor, producers, and we go through and we change the luminance, colour, all kinds of different things that you would probably associate with more with um, Photoshop. Essentially, you're colouring every single shot of the movie, average of about 1,500 different shots per movie, uh, and, and that's, that's just an average. Work. It's a bit like a, a painting in a way. Everyone has to come to an agreement and it can be a very challenging process, yes. but it's ultimately really rewarding. But the real basics are matching the shots together so nothing jumps out to an audience member. And then being creative as well and creating moods, styles, and the rest is all comes with experiences. Knowing when someone talks to you about can something be cooler, you know that it, it needs more cyan rather than blue or green. You kind of can already judge what you need to make that shot look better and for the client to go, wait, oh, that's great. It comes right down to a real instinct for it. And it just becomes very natural. Other than correcting levels of lighting and matching up colours of shots within the same scene, what's the purpose of grading? It's really to, to realise the director's vision. You also are creating styles or moods. Mm -hmm. It's not just about fixing films and shot some in studio, some location, some various uh, other conditions yeah. which we'll see on some of the trailers we're about to see, but also you know, put it in really simple terms. If it's a comedy, you want to keep the colours up and horror film, everything has to be pulled down dark. And not all of that is done on set. You're never quite sure what you're going to be dealing with. You have to manage the uh, the personalities. As mm -hmm. a, you know, we're talking about creative people, so it's a real, <laughs> yes. it's a real you, you know, you have to be a real diplomat at times as well. It's the director and producer's film, and as long as they walk out of here happy, then I'm happy, really. Having worked in the industry for 26 years on high-end television and an impressive slate of feature films, no doubt those listening will have already seen several examples of your work. You're kindly going to give us an exclusive colourist commentary of some of your most recent films that you've worked on in the last year, including Amy, The Lady in the Van, Allegiant and The Super Stylish Man from Uncle. First of all, let's look at your most recent film, the latest in the Divergent series, Allegiant which you've just returned from grading in LA, which came out in the cinemas a few weeks ago. Allegiant, as you'll be very quickly aware, is a very uh, highly computer-generated uh, film. We've got a lot of the backgrounds uh, you'll see here and a lot of the actual um, buildings and the rain are all, are all kind of computer-generated. So what we're looking at here is the, the what they call the fringe sequence, which has got a very particular colour palette as you can see very interesting colors which we which we kind of uh, designed with the visual effects team together so the fact there's so many computer generated backgrounds was probably the the, the hardest thing about this in, in terms of matching them in making them look realistic to to this i understand the scenes which are obviously it's shot in a studio but very naturalistic very the overall color gamut was pretty colorful as you can see quite high contrast deep blacks in that's in this sequence more cgi backgrounds here going on with the with the jeff daniels sequence more fringe material very different uh, outer world experience there and um, i've worked with this dp a, a few times before this is probably the the most difficult um, project to work on in terms of the sheer amount of visual effects that are in the movie we used what we call visual effects mats to time or grade or, or color the background separately to the to the foreground images so that uh, we could make changes to the computer generated elements separately and that was very important because it also saved us an awful lot of time and the visual effects people could could actually get their shots approved and into the cut just that bit earlier. There's some really um, interesting scenes and looks flashing through here. Fast cutting, all those backgrounds are all separately coloured. Lots of blues and oranges. A very interesting challenge um, and I got on board, I was asked to go to um, Los Angeles uh, from the director of photography who uh, requ requested I fly over particularly just for that um, project itself and I was there for eight or nine weeks. It was very challenging but ultimately you know we, we got there and we had limited time because of the release date was already set and we were working 
up to you know, three weeks, four weeks before the release date. I saw it last Friday. I was really, really impressed because it's basically a futuristic landscape. It's the earth after it's been devastated with radiation. And the land is red, the the water is red or blood, and that's all being created either with CGI or in your grading suite. And it's, it's quite incredible. Yeah, we had to do many um, pre-production tests because they weren't sure what direction to go with. They gave me some plates to work with and I gave them about 10 different versions of all kinds of colours and different you know layers of saturation and uh, they eventually picked out you know a number seven as the best one and then we worked on that a bit more and concentrated and just narrowed it down with a bit of tweaking either end didn't help that those guys were in the states and i was in london but we managed okay. to get for it did a few sort of you know conference calls and we have a system here where they can view in the states what i'm looking at in london in real time that's and, incredible and i remember and actually it witnessing helps. it about yes. two years ago <laughs> right okay <laughs> Well, even now it's 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 gone it, it, it it's gone crazy now, and uh, believe it or not, you can actually there's a system where they can have a laser pointer in their room and point it at the screen, and it shows up on my my screen, which is that's that is incredible. Slightly, and I can't quite get my head around that yet. But that's yeah. amazing. And next, on to the winner of this year's 2016 documentary category at the Oscars, Amy. So Amy is rather different to most, most projects in as much that um, it's designed as a documentary all from archive material mm -hmm. or all from captured material or it goes from the worst, the worst flavour of material which is YouTube all the way up to a lovely you know, um, high definition master from the BBC. And the massive challenge with Amy is that we have to somehow make that cinematic and palatable to a cinematic audience when you're blowing it up to in some theatres some quite big screens so it's a very different challenge to what I, I normally have to do with when I've got a director of photography next to me who's got some idea of what it's supposed to look like and this was very different and sometimes it was a bit of compromising going on because the the master material wasn't as as great quality as we'd have liked and that's mixed in with some camera footage and and it's all different shapes sizes formats it's quite a challenge it's a very different way of working but ultimately because because there is no DP, the colorist kind of becomes the director of photography, who is uh, the biggest collaborator to someone in, in my chair. They're the person that you kind of talk the same language as the director of photography, and you, you're you there to help them submit to the director what he had in mind. So we can play this now. This is, this is a very nice teaser trailer, I guess. It does show you some of the different images. So we start off, this is her obviously home home footage when we I had to sort of decolour this to separate it out from when she's actually an adult. That's been taken. So we had, as you can see there, this is now full colour because it's her in her glory and happy times. So it's a question of marrying all this up to try and make it as cinematic as possible. So we treated it in very much a film world um, using filmic colours if there is such a thing but just taking away any garish video-y reds and highlights just to try and sit it all down so it looks like it's actually been photographed properly which of course it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination particularly this kind of material which is the paparazzi stuff which just captured on the street uh, very handheld there's a very nice master there from the Grammy Awards um, so some was good some was not not so good and it was a question of marrying it all together so it wasn't jarring I had to do an awful lot of reframing some of the material was square oblong any kind of thing stretched not stretched so we had to put it all together and kind of make sense of it in some cases we had to actually degrade the the better quality material so it would match into something which wasn't particularly so we had to put even put a little bit of softening in to help that so that was Amy, but when you work on those sort of projects that you do feel really part of the production because you feel like you're needed an awful lot <laughs> more to feel even creating part of the creative process. You're involved a lot more in the design and the how things should look and you've kind of got a bit of a free reign. We also kept, um, there's an awful lot of titles and credits on screen on Amy because there isn't a talking head, so it's all voice of, or you have to say the, the location. And often, depending on what was in the frame, we'd have to move these titles around. So we kept those all live in the, in the, as part of the colouring live. For, for those people who haven't seen the film, the lyrics of Amy's songs form the plot of the mm. film to a degree. Her words become the narration. And as we hear her sing, we also see the words and the lyrics appearing on the screen and they move around. So um, you obviously had the challenge of grading around those 
moving elements. Yeah, like you say, they were very important. The actual the actual font of that was based on her own diaries. They were kind of hand drawn back out by a titles designer and placed on top of the, the screen in the, the relevant position. And then we decided they should stay there or move around depending on what I'd done with the background image. So they kind of had to be a real you know, collaborative process between getting those two elements in. That was very important to the director having having the lyrics on screen because like like you said he felt that that was the really the crux of it and it really did uh, you know ring true to her story and aside from the lyrics we also had all the all the captions all the voices of a little trick for those of you that are going to see the movie again or haven't seen it yet every time there is a locator you'll see it's got a little bit of color to it that color is supposed to match something else in the in in the frame which no one has picked up yet what's a locator sorry so if you've got uh say amy's bedroom camden mm -hmm. That, that Camden may be in orange, and that's because there's something orange or she's got an orange sofa in the room. So you'll always, you'll always be able to link ah. something there, which no one's picked up. And that, in turn, is based on the cover of the Frank album. Excellent. So oh, little, I little like trick, that. I'd love to look there. out for that. And you I'm must be thrilled that it won the Oscar for mm, Best Documentary. Yeah, it's especially thrilled, as, as I was in Los Angeles at the time as well. So I met, so I met up with a the team there. They're a very nice you know, team, very nice people, very down to earth. So I'm especially pleased for them. It's a fantastic film. Thank you for talking to us about it. Now let's have a look at the incredibly stylish film from Guy Ritchie for Warner Brothers, Man From U.N.C.L.E., which was released in August 2015. Okay, Man From U.N.C.L.E. was a very glossy, quite nicely styled film, which we'll see um, when, we, when we look at the trailer in a second. This was a director of photography called John Matheson, who I'd worked with an awful lot. First collaboration with him was The Kingdom of Heaven for Ridley Scott. Mm -hmm. And John is a very traditional director of photography. He loves working with 35mm film. He loves lighting everything as he wants it himself. He would still be doing his colour in the laboratory if he had a choice, slightly less able to do that now in this digital world. He shot it digitally, we did add, actually add some film grain to give it some kind of texture. I'll talk through the look, like I say it's a very nice, very nice glossy looking, uh, and actually the trailer's very, it's got, it's got an awful lot of uh, to move it in it. That first shot actually is shot in the day and we made it look like night, which was something in the boat sequence whenever that comes up you'll see there's a bit of a mixture of real night and what we call day for night, where I have to make everything look very dark and set in. So, like I say, John Matheson does like to light on set. He doesn't do an awful lot of manipulation within the grade or the, or, or the colouring. Um, but really, this was all about keeping everything nice and rich. Everything was about the costume design, the production design, some lovely dresses and cars and, and uh, outfits there. And the guys, are looking, everyone's looking super smart. So rather than go for a kind of moody spy, we went for a kind of quite a rich, uh, highly saturated colours all round. Very 70s, almost like what we describe as ectochrome colour, so quite vivid blues and reds whenever they come up. You can see the sea there. We've gone to town a bit on the sea there. Uh, but generally, really, really smart looking film. You won't be able to see the film grain, but certainly on the big screen, there was a little bit of film grain that we, we, we put into the image there. See, no nice harsh lighting all the way through, and this is where it gets super slick. John's very, uh, he plays everything down in what he does, but he's actually very, very talented. He will think he's, he's, uh, he's worked on Gladiator and Phantom of the Opera and all that, so he's very, uh, very experienced. Lots of cuts, so when I said about uh, an average film being 1500, this would probably be more like 2500 cuts in this film. Yeah. Um, because of the action sequences really. Most of it was based on real uh, real practical effects and with a bit of CGI to help sell it in many ways or wire removals and stuff like that. But a very uh, nice looking film, a film I'm very proud of how, how it came out and sometimes keeping it simple it doesn't you know you don't have to go to town on it too much and we really did that we worked with what we had and um, didn't overcook it in too many ways and it's come out really nice. Guy Ritchie's films have a certain flavour to them and he likes that snappy style of editing and I think that all that all, that all plays a part as well. Mm. But yeah, certainly the design was really what I, I enjoyed most about it, definitely. And for you, I imagine it's quite fun to work with um, a DOP like John Matheson. Everything was there on screen, so we just made it look the best we possibly could. And it was mainly about polishing, really, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel on that film. It was very... Uh, it's a highly polished film. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, you know, it's got a decent budget to it, which helps as well. So, you know, you know they, probably had a, they probably had all the equipment they wanted to on set. So it's, uh, and, that, and, that, and that shows on screen as well. 
Finally, let's have a look at a film I absolutely loved when I saw it last year, the charming British comedy, The Lady in the Van. The Lady in the Van, it's kind of typical British medium budget film. The British weather plays its part, of course. Hopefully I'll be able to point out a couple of those when we look at the trailer. The overall palette was rather subdued, and also the main thing was getting the, the van actually to be, to be the right colour as well. Okay, so here we are. Here we are. This is a typical street, so very gloomy. <laughs> Nothing actually in the sky is there to grab hold of. Uh, so the van, that was actually the second van that's used in the film, not the classic yellow. There's a very early shot of Maggie Smith as a flashback, which we, I tried desperately to make her look 30 years younger. Um, not sure if I succeeded very well or not, but uh, you can be the judge of that when if you see the film. This is the streets, and you see lots of sun. A lot of these are cut out of sequence actually, but there's a lot of sun in and sun out issues. Very nice uh, bunch of filmmakers, another collaboration with a long time DP friend called Andrew Dunn. So there's the, there's the famous yellow, yellow van, as you can see, just about getting enough light in the background there was darkened off, so it was all about her. So a lot of, a lot of the work is about putting in shapes to, to basically make the characters stand out. It's basically creating the vignettes, which are areas of the frame which are darker than others, just to frame you. There you are, rain and then sun, although that is cut slightly out of sea. Uh, lots of d different colours. We've even put in a little bit of film grain into that as well, a tiny bit of film grain into that throughout, because it's set, it's set in, I think it's set in the 80s, I think is the, the, main, the, main, the main crux of it. Back to the amount of shots, probably below average, I would say, for that film. Nice slow panoramic views. The seaside shots you saw there, we did punch the colour up a lot on those because they were supposed to be like, oh, she's gone to the seaside, isn't it nice here? <laughs> Even though the weather on the day wasn't that great either. So you're putting in a bit of extra contrast to create the sunlight and very nice crew on that film. Nicholas Heitner, the director, is very famous for theatre productions. So he's done several in the past, such as The Crucible and The History Boys, with exactly the same film crew. He knows who he's working with, what he's doing, and he gets the best out of the actors and actresses. So he kind of leaves the rest of it to us. So on that film, it was very much myself and the director of photography working on um, was there any difference between the beginning of the film? I think it obviously it spans at least 16 years. Mm. Did you have to, especially when you did the flashback of 30 years, did you try and make that look a certain era? Yeah, I think from memory it was, I think we kept it very neutral, very grey. Did a kind of a, like a clean up on her face, trying to take, trying to de-age her a little bit by, bearing in mind she's in her 80s, so there's, there's, uh, there's only a certain amount you can do. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing in the film. Yeah. Uh, the other thing on that film, obviously, there's a, a character that's playing Alan Bennett. There's, it's the same character, but there's two of them, so there's yeah. a lot of split screen. Ah, oh, yes, I wanted to ask about that, yes. because um, we reviewed it a few months ago. There's a point in the film where you have the two Alan Bennetts walking side by side with Maggie Smith in between them, and I have no idea how that's done. I can understand the notion of a split screen when there's nothing interrupting the divide. And there's a few of those, yeah. But how on earth did they do that? Yeah, with great difficulty, I think. And that was, that was the, the visual effects team biggest challenge so yeah but it was still a split screen but it wasn't obviously a straight cut they were having to draw around mm -hmm. every arm movement every thing that's going on and maggie was there in the middle so in fact in that in the in a cemetery scene at the end we were shooting one side and the other side the sun did come and go and it was actually going in, in between the takes so my job was then to balance out the two sides of the frame as well as it was happening so that was that was tricky well, that was incredible. It's so fascinating to hear about the processes you went through to achieve these vastly different looks. If listeners have been inspired by hearing you speak, how would somebody go about forging a career as a colourist? I know that for you it was very much a family affair. Um, how can other people get into it? Um, the times have changed now from when I got into it. I was kind of born into a, a, a film laboratory and then it morphed into a digital world. Not quite literally born into a film Well, almost, <laughs> almost. Third generation, <laughs> so uh, almost. Wow. So nowadays, with everything almost being exclusively digital in terms of the colouring side, there are various different routes. What a lot of people tend to do is start working at a facility, starting point as a runner. We have colourist assistants, we have junior colourists, we also have colourists that work on set and more colour time the dailies on a, on, 
on a shoot every day just to make them look palatable and so that the producers are happy what they're seeing every day and the director of photography is happy what you're seeing every day and then if you prove yourself in that world you kind of get more contacts and especially when you get into the assistant colorist role you might then tend to do a bit more of the actual coloring before you know it you're in the room with directors of photography and directors and you're getting known getting to know colorists and learning from them is very very important and you have to have a certain eye for it you also have like I explained at the start you have a certain personality for it I don't and think the patience <laughs> patience yeah so you'd say to people to um, get experience within facilities um, yeah. and to if they have any of the software if they can go out and shoot something and then um, yeah. color it and if they're into photography and like I say, um, just think about every every image you see. Think about how it, the light's captured, where the light's falling on someone. You're you're asking the the viewer or the director always wants you to look at what's important within each frame. And if you can help that tell the story, then that's 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 your role. Wonderful. That's some great advice. I hope that's been helpful to some people out there who you might have inspired over the last few minutes. I know that through doing such a fascinating job for so many years, you've got some incredible stories about the industry. Can you give us an insight? Most of the stories probably won't be able to repeat. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's mostly based on the people you meet. Nothing happens with a room, well, apart from one time when it flooded, but I won't go, I won't go into that. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I mean, I've met some amazing directors over the years, some real sort of legends of the cinema, and you're never quite sure what they're really going to be like until they walk in the room. The one that stands out for me more than any of them was Lord Attenborough. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky to work on his last feature film, and he was well into his 80s. He wasn't very steady on his feet, and uh, what am I? God, you know what we're dealing with here and he came in and was a complete gentleman as everyone always says about him and he was joking around you know we reviewed a film back for him what, what we had done and, and in those days this was quite early the processing power of the computers wasn't quite up to speed so we used to have to run it in a sli slightly lower resolution than what it should have been it was about half resolution so it was a little bit soft I mean I'm talking a little bit most people never noticed it and Richard Attenborough being in his 80s after about two minutes he turned around to me and said is this screen a bit soft Thanks. Excellent. And I thought, wow, if I'm 88 or whatever he is and I'm still noticing that the screen's a little bit soft, then I'm, I'm doing something right. Yeah. But that <laughs> just showed you what an eye he had. I was gobsmacked. That's incredible. He spotted it. Well, Paul, thank you so much for having us here in your grading theatre. It's been absolutely fascinating. And thank you so much for running through all of those incredible films that you've worked on. I hope everyone found it interesting who's listening to it. And uh, yeah, keep going to the cinema. Who knows, you might end up in my chair one day. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for listening to Film Focus with Emily Cook. Happy movie going!